going on, guys? Thank you so very much for joining me right here on Off The Script. It is Friday, June 19th, 2020. What a day, man. What a day. Seems like there's always something new in the pro wrestling community. If you guys came here to hear me talk about the speaking out movement, you will be very disappointed. I am actually saving that for tomorrow's Off the Script. Now, I was actually going to talk about it today so you guys have it ready for Patreon and you guys have it ready for tomorrow and I don't have to worry about anything over the weekend, but alas... Pro Wrestling does not want me to have the weekend off, and I did not record off the script today. I did not talk about the movement that is going on right now in the community, and we are taking out the trash as we speak in the community, but I'm glad that I did not. I am glad that I did not record early, because there is just so much information that is still coming out. There are Many more cases being revealed, many more names being revealed, one of which you've seen on SmackDown tonight, whether you believe him or you don't believe him, I am not falling into the trap, and you guys can hate me for it, you can blast me for it, I know I'm a good human being, I know what is right and wrong, I know my grandpa and my father... My mother raised a damn good fucking son at the end of the day. I know what is right and what is wrong. I know how to treat people with respect, believe it or not. I mean, if you believe the Cretans out there, I am a narcissistic prick. But those who know me and those who are in my circle know who I am. That's all I give a shit about. I know what is right and wrong. I know how to act amongst people. I know how to treat people the way that is right, with decency, like a human being. Okay, I don't need a lecture on anything. But I will say this, with Enzo, with the Velveteen Dream, and everybody else that is being accused of such heinous acts, it's terrible. Trash needs to be taken out in the wrestling community, okay? But at the end of the day, there are nothing but accusations. We don't have any information on anything that is being said about anybody. All it is, is Twitter. All it is, are people that you and I don't know, people that the majority of the world don't know, coming out, releasing statements on Twitter, writing in their notepad on Twitter, and sending it out to social media. There's nothing of a police investigation, there's nothing of a full-blown company-wide investigation by all these wrestling companies. Nobody has any other information outside of what you've seen on Twitter. So before you go and blame somebody for something that we all know is wrong, and before you start ruining careers, just let everything take its natural course. The garbage will be taken out. Karma will come back and get everybody, but let it just be. B. Everybody has the right to speak out. You could say whatever you want. But let things take its natural course. I will not make the same mistake that I did with Enzo. Because I was one of many that blamed him for something that he was ultimately innocent on. He was proven innocent. Lost his career, ruined his reputation. Why would you want that to happen to anybody? And the same thing was happening with Patrick Patrick Clark, the Velveteen Dream, just a couple of months ago. That seemingly died. I'm surprised that hasn't been brought up. If not, you know, in the last couple of weeks, I'm surprised it hasn't been brought up again. Now, I may be wrong. It might be something that people are talking about now, and I just don't know. But I will not make the same mistake. And I'm certainly not making it with Matt Riddle. No matter what was said about Matt Riddle, I will not be talking about it here. I'm going to save all my collective thoughts. I'm going to write something down really brief for tomorrow's podcast. But one of those names that was brought up in all of this speaking out movement was Matt Riddle, who debuted tonight on SmackDown. 
And we're going to talk about SmackDown. We're going to talk about Matt Rule. We're going to talk about him going one-on-one with AJ Styles. We're going to go and talk about how he is a game changer on this show. We're going to talk about how I did not like the way he was immediately booked against AJ Styles tonight. Because I am a traditionalist. I can see what WWE tried to do. But every single time they got somebody like a Matt Riddle or somebody new, they go to the same old WWE protocol. And I don't like it. The WWE ways, the WWE protocol needs to change. Because it's tired, it is formulaic, it is basic, it is the same old. We need something new. You cannot take somebody like Matt Riddle and do what you did with him tonight and then expect everybody to be happy. It's got to be right. Tonight, I don't think it was right, even though they created something now in the eyes of everybody. Oh, he's legit. We'll talk about it. I don't want to jump ahead, but we'll talk about it. AJ Styles versus Matt Riddle tonight. He debuted. He interrupted the Intercontinental Championship celebration on SmackDown like I knew he would. It was either one of two things. It was either that or Baron Corbin. And WWE seemingly gave you a little bit of both tonight. Bray Wyatt and the Firefly Funhouse returned to SmackDown, probably to continue his feud with boring Slowman for the Universal Championship. But is it Bray Wyatt, the Fiend? Or is it another version of Bray Wyatt? Is Bray Wyatt dipping into the Matt Hardy bag of tricks? We'll talk about it. Miz and Morrison also appeared on the show tonight. Miz TV with Mandy Rose. That was their guest. And then we had, obviously, Seamus and Daniel Bryan. Uh, not Seamus and Daniel Bryan. Seamus and Jeff Hardy continuing their feud. And at this point, there is no doubt about it. It is WWE now just exploiting Jeff Hardy for what they really do think of Jeff Hardy. And I can honestly say I am over the entire Seamus and Jeff Hardy situation. So we'll go over that as well tonight on the podcast right here for Off The Script and SmackDown here on the show, man. Thank you guys so very much for joining me. Follow me on social media, at JD from NY206. That's on Twitter and Instagram. Make sure you guys hit that thumbs up down below if you maybe find anything on this show enjoyable, entertaining, if I make you laugh, if you enjoy any of my takes here, or if you fucking hate me and say, this guy's an asshole, leave a rating, leave a rating. Every rating helps out the video. So I appreciate that guys. Again, hit that subscribe button down below. Turn on that bell for all notifications. Become one of the many that have joined team JD. We are nearing 118,000 subscribers. I really appreciate that one. Make sure you guys support the podcast via Patreon, Patreon patreon.com. Slash JD from NY206. If you missed off the script earlier today, an epic rant on the Beaver, Kevin Dunn and his statements about face masks and how if you wear a face mask, you're not a fan of WWE and how he did not allow face masks in the building while WWE was taping TV and their entire CV19 protocol. I shit on it all. Go and check it out. Off the Script went live earlier today. That is down below. So make sure you guys go and watch that. Along with NXT, AEW, and Monday Night Raw. If you guys want your weekly fill of all the shows, every single week, Off the Script has you covered. And today's podcast is brought to you by my good friends over at Audible. AudibleTrial.com slash Off the Script. Make sure you guys sign up. Get 30 days free and one free audiobook of your choice. So make sure sure you guys do that as well and get your free audiobook on me. That's audibletrial.com slash off the script. SmackDown opened up, man, with Renee Young and the new Intercontinental Champion, AJ Styles. The ring was surrounded by most of the SmackDown roster. We've seen Cesaro out there, Baron Corbin, Mojo Rawley, Daniel Bryan, Big E and Kofi Kingston, Chad Gable, Otis Tucker, Gren Metalik, Lince Dorado, Sheamus, Drew Gulak, and the other Russo, who's not hurt. 
I believe it's Jey Uso, right? Jimmy's the one hurt, right? I could be mistaken. I don't know. One of them's hurt. One of them was out there tonight. SmackDown Championship, the Intercontinental Championship, was in the middle of the ring on a podium. AJ Styles was in the ring. He thanked Renee for talking about his impressive resume as she ushered him out there with a very nice introduction. Renee asked what the IC title means to AJ Styles since he's never won it before. Styles says the cream rises to the top. He said Renee wasn't qualified to present the IC title to him, so he ushered her out of the ring and looked around the ring and deemed everybody unworthy except for one man he wanted to present the Intercontinental Championship to him, and that was Daniel Bryan. Bryan entered the ring even though he did not want to. Styles said all he has to do is wrap the belt around his waist. Yes, belt around his waist. Vince may be losing his mind that he's letting all these words back to television. Belt, strap, right? He got uh, Bailey, those straps. Usually Vince don't like those words. Every report that I read said Vince McMahon hates the word belt because belts are used to hold up your pants. And he doesn't like referring to the championships as belts. That's just Vince. I don't give a shit either way, but I'm just relaying to you information that you might not know. It's all about respect, he said. I beat you to get it. So come on in. It's the respectful thing to do. He said he trusted Brian not to do anything stupid as he turned his back. Brian did it, but Styles said he didn't congratulate him loud enough for all to hear. Brian grabbed the microphone and then very sarcastically yelled, Congratulations, AJ Styles. Last week, you were the better man. He said, while they disagree about a lot of things, he has great respect for his in-ring ability. He said he thinks he has the chance to be the greatest intercontinental champion in WWE history. Certainly has the chance to. Will he? Probably not. Not in the modern WWE. He listed off some of the wrestlers at ringside who would be great opponents. He looked at Grand Metallic. He looked at Chad Gable. He looked at Big E and said, if you had matches with all these guys, it would be great. I want you to be a fighting champion. So Styles cuts him off and says, listen, I'm going to do things my way and only top contenders will get a shot. So he said, Brian is at the end of the line on that list. You ain't getting no shot anytime soon. He may think he's one of the best guys that could vie for that championship, but bro, you were at the end of that list, says AJ Styles. Brian then said, never mind me, what about Drew Gulak? What about Drew Gulak? Correct me if I'm wrong, but Drew Gulak earned a shot by beating you two weeks ago. Styles says he's not handing anything out to anybody. He's not handing the title shot out to just anybody. Styles says he won't do things Brian's way. He said he will only defend the title against the number one contender and the next wrestler. There's another one of those words that Vince might have slept on that leaked its way to TV. Wrestler. Now they're wrestlers, not superstars. To stand up and run their mouth, We'll have to deal with the consequences. And then all of a sudden, we hear, bro. Bro. Matt Riddle made his way to the ring and bro debuted on SmackDown. So we got Matt Riddle coming on out. He's in the ring. Everybody around the ringside area is all excited. He's giving high fives and fist pumps, right? Riddle X Styles when he was in the ring. What's up, bro? Styles says, listen, I know exactly who you are. I know exactly who you are. You're the talk of the town. He said he sees someone, and I don't know if that was really, like, it can't be, uh, you know, direct. It couldn't be having to do with the situation today. That was just a uh, really eerie coincidence that, oh, he's the talk of the town. Clearly, he was one of the major talks of the town Earlier this afternoon, for reasons I am sure Matt Riddle does not want. But I just found that funny that AJ Styles says, You're the talk of the town. Very eerie coincidence there. As if WWE knew what was going to happen. Which, of course, they did. He said he sees someone without shoes. 
That is the first reference of his WWE run. No shoes here, Matt Riddle. How long before WWE puts fucking boots on him? I don't know. I'm still waiting. You know it's coming. So clearly that was an issue. I see someone without shoes standing in my ring, says Styles. Riddle says, bro, I never wear shoes. Styles says he's looking for a handout. Riddle says, listen, listen, I'm not looking for anything. Clearly, you're the face that runs the place. But Riddle says, you may be the face that runs the place, but I am the bro that's going to run the show. Clearly, Bruce is writing nursery rhymes on SmackDown. Man, what a creative genius, my buddy. Bruce is! Styles distracted him with the belt, then punched him in the face. Riddle knocked Styles out of the ring with some kicks. We go to commercial break, and that was it. So clearly... Riddle is being set up for the Intercontinental Championship against AJ Styles. As I predicted, it was either that or Baron Corbin. Now, I didn't think WWE was going to give us a match between Matt Riddle and AJ Styles. But what do you think that they did? What do you think WWE went ahead and did tonight on SmackDown? If you guessed Matt Riddle versus AJ Styles, JD, ding, 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 ding. You, sir, are... A loser! There you go. I wish I was hearing this. I really wish that my prediction was something that did not come true. Not yet, anyway. Not yet, anyway. Now, I understand that everybody wants Matt Riddle to get off on the right foot. I understand everybody wants Matt Riddle to become a major player on SmackDown. But that does not mean throw him into a fucking match with AJ Styles immediately on the first show that he debuts on. It's not the way things should be. That's the typical WWE protocol. It's the typical WWE formula. I don't really care about that. I want things to change for the better. I want TV to mean something. I want introductions to mean something. I want builds to big matches like this to mean something. No matter how WWE weasel themselves out of this and no matter who was casting a supporting role in this, like a Baron Corbin or a Daniel Bryan, I don't want to see that. I don't want to see any of that. I want WWE to do the right thing and that is create compelling television, create compelling characters, create consistency, have wins, mean something on TV, and then give me the money match. Why are you giving me a Matt Riddle versus AJ Styles match unannounced? Just out of left field on SmackDown. I don't get that logic. I really don't. And it only gets worse from here. Let me get on to the match. So they have a match. Goes about 13 minutes or so. Styles versus Riddle. Was it a very good TV match? Absolutely. Matt Riddle changes the game. He single-handedly changes the feel of the show. He makes the show watchable. He makes the show legit. He's going to make that entire division for the Intercontinental Championship mean something. Because he's that good of an athlete. He's that good of a pro wrestler. So Styles is out there with Riddle. First match of the night. Riddle hits a German suplex to gain an early advantage. Landed him right on his head. Followed with a series of gut wrench suplexes. Riddle hits Styles with some kicks to the side of the head. Goes for the very first near fall of the match. Styles fought back. Hit Riddle with a standing drop kick. Riddle rocks Styles with a series of kicks in the corner. Styles clotheslines Riddle right off to the apron. Riddle tried to pull Styles to the floor, but he kicked off and Riddle collided with Baron Corbin on accident. Baron Corbin and Matt Riddle went face to face as we go to commercial break. So we get back from break. Styles was in control, heel over babyface, submission in the middle of the ring. Styles used a snapdragon suplex for a near fall. And he followed up with a knee drop, but Riddle fought back. Styles caught Riddle's leg and hit a dragon screw leg whip. Riddle missed a high kick, and Styles used a chop lock on Riddle's injured knee, obviously setting up for the calf crusher. Riddle fought back, hit a fisherman suplex. Styles missed a charge in the corner. Riddle hit a forearm in the corner, followed up by another suplex. Riddle missed a kick and Stanley Moonsault, but hit a broton 
his version of the senton for a near fall. Riddle locked on the bro mission, his finishing move, or one of his finishing moves. But Styles countered into the calf crusher. Riddle made it to the ropes in front of Brian. Brian and the other baby faces checked on Riddle. Styles shoved Brian to get out of his face. And then they started going back and forth. Styles attempted the phenomenal forearm, but Riddle caught him and caught him off the phenomenal forearm into the bro Derek for the win. And Matt Riddle wins his first match on SmackDown. And this was a huge win put over by Michael Cole and Corey Graves and instantly became a huge player on SmackDown on Friday nights. All the baby faces in the ring celebrated with Riddle. People were asking me why the baby faces in the heels were still outside watching this match after the championship celebration segment was clearly over. I'm assuming that WWE wanted to really make Matt Riddle's debut mean something, so they had everybody take a very keen interest in his debut match on SmackDown, thus leaving them out there. Now that that's over. 12 to 13 minutes, very good TV match. I have no problem with what they produced in the ring. In fact, I expected it to be very good, and I'm sure it will get better as the time goes on and the more times we see these guys in the ring. But folks, I know some people will not agree with me. I know there are people that I've conversed with on Twitter tonight that don't agree with me. I don't really understand why, but I'm not going to sit here and argue and fight over people's opinions on pro wrestling. We got bigger things going on in the community instead of just me shitting on creative, okay? But I watch this show week in and week out, every single week. I've been watching this product for over 30 years. The creative has only gotten worse every single week. Every single time WWE has a champion, whether it's a champion that's had a solid reign, Going into another pay-per-view, WWE usually finds, and it, it, let me let me rephrase that, a championship that WWE really doesn't do much of anything with. And they realize, oh, we need to put this title on said show. Let's get a contender for said title and do it and go about it in the most meaningless way. That's exactly what the Intercontinental Championship has been for WWE. That is what all their mediocre titles, their, their uh, secondary titles mean. In WWE, right? The only championships that mean anything are the ones Charlotte holds, the WWE Championship sometimes, and the Universal Championship sometimes. Other than that, all the other championships in the WWE are nothing but props, and they don't mean anything. WWE usually finds a contender for a title by putting whoever they deem contender that month in a match with the champion, have the challenger beat the champion, and then thus, oh, he beat the champion, he's now in line for a future title shot. Boom. There's no work involved. There's no building your way to a title match. There's no working your way up the ranks. People are conditioned to say, this is okay. XXXXX is okay in WWE because you've been brainwashed and conditioned to think this is right, but I'm here to tell you that things need to change and it is not right. No matter who it is. It could be Gulak, it could be Brian, it could be fucking Lindsay Dorado for all I fucking care. Whoever the next man is in line for a title shot should, here's a fucking clue, here's a concept, maybe work your way up for a fucking title match and beat some opponents on the show. I would have gladly taken a Matt Riddle versus a Cesaro or Matt Riddle versus a Chad Gable or Matt Riddle versus an Ali or Matt Riddle versus a Drew Gulak. I would have taken Matt Riddle versus Baron Corbin to build him up before you give him a championship match. But WWE opted to do Matt Riddle and AJ Styles first. How does that make AJ Styles look tonight? As Intercontinental Champion. WWE, all they did, all they did coming out of last week, going into this week on social media, on YouTube, all they did was brag that Brian and Styles was an instant classic. AJ Styles won the Intercontinental Championship. They put over how important the Intercontinental Championship is in the annals of WWE history. They put over how important the Intercontinental Championship was to AJ Styles. So what do they have him do? In his very first match... Out of a five-star classic, from their words. 
Now, it wasn't a five-star classic to me. I said this time and time again. Can't have a five-star classic with five fucking commercials integrated into the match. Had an instant classic is what they said. Shows up the very next week and loses his first match. Non-title. How does that make the championship look? How does that make AJ Styles look? Some people tell me, well, bro, AJ Styles is bulletproof. No, he's not bulletproof. Because what was he doing before he got to SmackDown and before he was placed in this tournament? He was a loser. AJ Styles was portrayed as a loser. So now he starts winning some matches and then he's right back to losing his first match as champion. Folks, champions should not be losing on television. In no situation. Champions should not be losing to give whoever WWE deems the number one contender. They should not be losing to those people. They should not be losing in tag team elements, tag team situations where they take a pin and then build up a contender through that mean. You can't put a champion in a tag team match and then have somebody on the other team pin the champion in that tag team match. That means the champion is getting pinned on TV. The champion should not be getting pinned on TV. I don't know what else to tell you. It doesn't make them look good, no matter who it is. Yes, Matt Riddle needed to look good tonight. You and I both know who Matt Riddle is. Spare me the fucking bullshit that WWE needs to get this guy over in front of a casual audience. I think everybody after today knows who the fuck Matt Riddle is. WWE didn't need to put Matt Riddle in a situation where he's beating a champion who just won a title match last week. Your priority is very simple. Make the title look strong for Matt Riddle to take the title off of said champion. Don't make the champion look weak. Don't make the championship look weak. And don't have Matt Riddle come out day one and automatically become the number one contender. I said the same thing about Karrion Cross. You can't have him win one fucking match and then deem him the number one contender for Adam Cole. He just walked through the door. Have him take his coat off. Offer him a beverage. Offer him a seat. Fluff, it, fluff his wife's pillow so her, so her back is nice and comfortable sitting on the couch. Something. There's steps. There's steps involved here to make them comfortable. Jesus Christ. Unreal with you people. It's as if Scarlet's walking through the fucking door and you're, you're bowing down to her. Oh my God, t- take whatever you want. Raid my refrigerator. It's yours. My home is yours. Mi casa es su casa. Doesn't work that way. Doesn't work that way. I am tired of the typical WWE protocol. Things need to change. Wins and losses don't matter on WWE TV, JD. They need to. They need to. Long time has passed since these wins and losses mean something. Long time has passed. I want the days of old where people win and then be built up for a championship match. What was the rush? Are we getting Matt Rowe versus AJ Styles at Extreme Rules? For what? For the match to end in some screwy finish? And then we get it again at SummerSlam? Why don't you build a story and a compelling one at that and have the first match happen at SummerSlam so you don't need to do it six or seven times before we get there? Things need to change. They did the same thing with the tag team titles on this show. New Day have no competition in that division. What happens? Cesaro and Shinsuke Nakamura pin the tag team champions last week on SmackDown and now we're deemed, or the week before that, I don't even remember, and now we're deemed the number one contenders for the tag team championships because they beat the champions on TV. You're okay with that? This simple-minded approach, you're okay with that? Now, I may be looking too deep into it. I I may be going overboard, but it happens every single time. Things need to change. The standard that you know, the standard practices of WWE that you know need to change. Other than that, the match was fine. Now, WWE booked AJ Styles versus Drew Gulak next week in a situation where he wants to get a win back. Fine. What's going to happen after that? Matt Riddle already has a win over AJ Styles. 
Is it going to be Matt Riddle and Daniel Bryan versus AJ Styles and Barrett Corbin the following week on SmackDown? Being that Matt Riddle bumped into Barrett Corbin and he took issue with it. AJ Styles is clearly still feuding with Daniel Bryan. They're probably going to end up doing that. I could see, I could picture that. WWE's protocol needs to change. I don't care what anybody says. Things need to matter. I am sick and tired of watching these shows and nothing feels important. Nothing. They went backstage to a Jeff Hardy promo and Renee was sitting with Jeff Hardy. Renee asked how Hardy was holding up following Backlash and that brutal match with Sheamus. He says, everything here has been a roller coaster. Says he feels he's trying to turn his life around and has been forever. He said, bad times can haunt him if he lets them. He said he felt like he was turning things around. He said he extinguishes one fire, but then turns around and there's another. The struggle is real, he said. Renee asked about Seamus. She continued and said that he is targeting his past addictions and he is targeting his struggles. She asked how he's been dealing with this loss. And she said, Seamus is a reminder of everything that happened. How do you feel about this? He's like, yeah, Seamus is a reminder of what he doesn't like about himself. He said if he could just beat the holy hell out of him, it would give him the confidence that he is resilient. His spirit is strong, and he wants to turn things around. He said he will then begin to doubt himself again and wonder if he's a bad performer, a bad husband, a bad father. This is if he doesn't turn it around. He says he's learned one thing, is that he has to catch himself before he he starts thinking about all of this and spirals out of control. He said, just because Seamus says it doesn't mean it's true. He says he has to step back and realize he has been an adrenaline junkie since he was nine years old. He said, Seamus' problem isn't with him, it's with Seamus. He says he makes mistakes, his honesty and vulnerability for weakness, or he, he, he mistakes, Seamus mistakes Jeff Hardy's honesty and vulnerability for weakness. He said Seamus is another sickening obstacle, but he's overcome bigger obstacles than him. And then he concluded and said he is not done with Seamus yet. Now, I don't really understand where they're going with any more of this. I mean, they got one win each. The only thing I could possibly imagine is Seamus versus Jeff Hardy at Extreme Rules. And we got Jeff Hardy getting his win back and some no DQ match or something like that. Maybe a a barroom brawl or something like that. Who the fuck knows what they're going to end up doing? Because every time I look at this shit with Sheamus and Jeff Hardy, look at the story that they're telling with these two. I feel like they want to keep Jeff in a major program on TV, but at the same time, they want to keep him in in a major program on TV and they want to embarrass the shit out of him. They want to keep him in a major program on TV and then they want to highlight that he really is a junkie, an alcoholic, a failure. They want to continue making sure you understand who Jeff Hardy really is. As if they kind of know he's on his way out the door. I'm over this shit already. I really am. Ever since the urine in Seamus' face, I'm done. I have no more desire to watch anything with Jeff and Seamus anymore. Give me the final match and let's move on. There's nothing more to tell here. This is simply WWE exploiting Jeff, keeping him in a major program on TV and programming you and brainwashing you to realize and think every time you see him, he is exactly what Seamus says he is. He's a junkie. He's an alcoholic. He's a bad father. He's never going to get over his addictions. He's got past demons. He fucked his life up. He's a failure. He's a fuck up. That's all WWE is doing. Like I said, they realize he's on his way out the door. His redemption will be when he's gone. And WWE, until that time comes next year, they will show you what they really think of Jeff Hardy. It will not result in the redemption that we all thought that WWE was going to do. A respectable redemption. A possible world title redemption. It's not going to go that way. They're going to embarrass this guy until he's out of the company and joins Matt in All Elite Wrestling. That's all that this is doing. Kayla Braxton interviewed Chad Gable. Chad Gable about facing Mojo Rawley, who is eight inches taller than him. Thank you, Kayla. Thank you for being another individual in this huge bullshit storyline with Chad Gable, 
Yes, he's a small guy. I get it. I don't need to be told every single week. It's bad enough we got the fucking performers cutting promos on Chad Gable about how short he is in their work. I don't need the interviewers to now just egg this on more and more. Bruce is really coming up with some riveting television here. Yeah, let's bring uh, Chad Gable back to TV. Uh, The short jokes, that's what we're going to go with. That's what we're going to do with Chad Gable on TV. Because everybody needs to realize that this guy is not as tall as uh, Mojo Rawley. It's ridiculous. Bruce Pritchard. Riveting television by my, by my buddy Bruce. So Gable says he's wrestled heavyweights his whole life. And he knows how to deal with them. Mojo came up from behind and mocked him. Gable says, there's one thing I know about my opponents. And what they don't know is that I have eyes in the back of my head. He turned around and punched Mojo right in the jaw and then left. We go to commercial break. These guys get the jobber entrance. No entrance at all. We come back from commercial break and they're both in the ring and the bell rings. That's that. Chad Gable wins in three minutes. Chad Gable left left off the top rope. But Mojo caught him. Mojo then um, was pinned. Chad Gable rolled Mojo up and scored a three count. That was pretty much it. I barely took notes on this. Why would I? Meaningless. This means nothing. This fills five minutes of TV time. Two promo, three in the ring. Nobody cares. Now, if you thought SmackDown was bad on a weekly basis, folks, get a load of this for Monday. A Monday Night Raw commercial aired locally for me. I don't know if you guys got the same thing. Now, we already heard about this one on social media. Asuka will be defending the Raw Women's Championship against the android Charlotte Flair. The Street Profits will defend the Tag Team Championships of Monday Night Raw against the Viking Ninja Raiders. So that's that. It's disgusting how I even just think back to Monday Night Raw and, and think to myself, I have to sit through this shit again on Monday for three hours. It's unreal. It's unreal. They're, they're dressing Akira Tozawa up as a member of the Foot Clan. They're dressing him up as a member of the Foot Clan. Ninja Turtles. The Ninja Turtle evil group, the the bad guys on Ninja Turtles, the fucking Foot Clan. I guess the big guy can be Shredder. So Akira Tozawa is the leader of the Foot Clan. We got the big fucking basketball player guy, seven foot six, whatever the fuck his name is. He could be Shredder in this instance. You got Montez Ford, who's the party guy. He could be Michelangelo. You got Angelo Dawkins, who could be Raphael. You got Ivar, who could be Donatello. And then you got Eric, who could be Leonardo. You legitimately have the Ninja Turtles versus the fucking Foot Clan happening on Monday Night Raw right now. I mean, do I make sense or do I make sense? Just visualize that. You know that when you watch this shit on Monday, you're going to be visualizing the fucking Ninja Turtles and then the Foot Clan when all of this goes down on Monday. You're welcome. This is WWE Raw, folks. This is the Bruce Pritchard era of Monday Night Raw. The Moronics, the Iconics, Stuponics, the Get Off My TV Onyx, the I Watch Guy Fieri earlier this evening eat fucking Arancini and Lasagna Onyx, the Iconics, against Sasha Bailey, Tag Team Championships, Oh, great. Oh, great. Is WWE going to keep the streak alive with Sasha holding a title less than 30 days? We'll find out! R-Truth defends the 24-7 title, as if anybody fucking cares, against uh, the Foot Clan. Legitimately. Championship Raw Monday. Awesome. Awesome. It's not taped yet. Because WWE has failed to administer CV-19 testing. Now they have, but their tapings were delayed. So now Monday is going to be Raw, taped. And then I guess Monday will tape SmackDown for next week as well. 
So I can't wait for Raw Championship Monday, folks. Rey Mysterio also, they hype will be on Raw to confront the evil Seth Rollins. Ooh. Can't wait for that one either. Ric Flair will be there, and he will crown Randy Orton as the greatest wrestler ever. Did they call Shawn Michaels up? Did he give the okay for this one? Miz TV. Miz explained to Morrison on Miz TV that last week he lost focus when he pulled him off of Strowman. Morrison was very forgiving, complaining about how they changed the rules. Morrison says you shouldn't change the rules before the big game. Miz says they also had to worry about that canned ham covered in body hair. Otis. Morrison said Otis could have come out to cash in his Money in the Bank briefcase at any time. Morrison said, if not for Otis, one of them would be standing there as the WWE Universal Champion. So they introduced Mandy Rose soon after, making her Miz TV debut. Man, oh man, every time I look at John Morrison, I think to myself, I miss the Lucha Underground version of John Morrison. I really do. What happened to that John Morrison? I'd even take the Impact Wrestling John Morrison over the John Morrison that we have right now. John Morrison came into the WWE and everybody was looking at his body of work on the indies since he's been absent from the WWE and everybody thought that when he comes back, because it was inevitable, that this guy's going to be mega over. They're going to treat him different. He's going to be a world champion caliber athlete. The guy is amazing in the ring. He's just great. And then they paired him with The Miz. And it's almost as if they wanted John Morrison to fail immediately on coming back to the WWE. It's like their version of EC3, but this time John John Morrison is on TV getting buried. EC3 was off of TV getting buried. Oh, you want to go make your name in Mexico? Oh, you want to go make your name over in Impact Wrestling? Then you want to come back over here. Bro, we're going to put you with The Miz. Now, I don't know what's worse, being off TV in EC3's case or being paired with The Miz on TV. They're almost equal. EC3 should be lucky he was kept off TV. God knows what they would have done with him. Now he's got his release. He didn't break a sweat. Got paid for doing it. WWE looks like fools. But John Morrison looks like a bigger fool. John Morrison being paired with The Miz actually makes John Morrison look worse. No matter how good of friends they are, they could be best friends. Everything that The Miz does is awful. The Miz at one point, I was a Miz mark. I really was. When he won his first WWE championship, when he went on that great intercontinental championship run with Dolph Ziggler in 2016, Miz was also becoming a contender for the Intercontinental Championship while Seth Rollins was the Intercontinental Champion back in 2017. I believe he might have had a match with with Seth Rollins at uh, a Backlash or an Extreme Rules show in 2017. Great! Great match! He was winning matches. He was winning clean. He wasn't cheating. He was actually legit. And then all of a sudden, Shane McMahon happens. Tag team happens. Then he loses and loses and loses. John Morrison comes in. He tries to heal him. And then this is what we get. This is the product of everything that we've seen. John Morrison looks like a waste. He looks like a complete loser. And The Miz, don't get me started on him. He's looked like a loser for years. Why is this guy even on TV? I don't know how anybody enjoys what they're seeing out of John Morrison and The Miz. It is a fucking comedy duo. That has absolutely no legitimacy whatsoever. But JD, it's entertainment. JD, they're here for laughs. I'm not here for laughs. The last thing that SmackDown needs is laughter. They need some legitimacy. And the Miz and Morrison don't have that. Mandy came out. Miz asked her if she ever realized she was a terrible friend to Sonya Deville and always upstaging her. Mandy threatened to leave. She's like, I didn't come here to be fucking ridiculed on your show. Miz says they were just joking around, but they had a surprise for her, so don't leave. Out walks Sonya Deville. She walked out in a black suit, looking good. Mandy said, we're still on this. She said she understands that she's mad, but she's the one who went behind her back and tried to sabotage her personal life. Mandy said she's done with her. Sonya entered the ring, said she wishes she could be done, but she just can't. 
She said Mandy keeps getting the spotlight and she wonders what she did to deserve it. She said if it wasn't for Ms. TV, she wouldn't even be on the show. Sonia said the Hyper Smackdown said she'd be on Ms. TV, whereas she, Sonia, wasn't even mentioned. She said Mandy hasn't won matches or said anything of value that means anything to anybody. She said she needed help. She said what she did or all she did was make out with Otis poolside so everyone could see it. Mandy asked Sonia what she wants. Mandy said she can hurt her physically or try to. And she also said you can try to hurt me mentally as well. But she has people who are by her side. She said Otis has been there for her loyal since day one. She asked Sonia what she has besides being a fighter. You're all alone. Nobody likes you. So how much longer are you going to hand on to these petty resentments, Sonia? Sonia then said she will break it down really simple for her. She said she's not mad at her. She's just confused. She wanted to know what she needed to do to get the Mandy Rose treatment. She said the only difference between them is their appearance. She said she is superior to Mandy in every way. She said she's going to take away the one thing that matters to her and rip her apart piece by piece until her outsides are just as ugly as what is on the inside. She attacked Mandy Rose and they fought. Miz and Morrison were standing in the corner reacting like two little schoolboys. Sonia fled and then Miz blocked Mandy from chasing her. Mandy slapped Miz and her music played and she left the ring. So clearly, clearly, Dolph Ziggler was moved to Monday Night Raw. And I don't know if you guys realize that, but Dolph Ziggler, we'll talk about it tomorrow and off the script. Dolph Ziggler was moved to Monday Night Raw in exchange for the trade, the future considerations for AJ Styles. So that was the deal that WWE had come up with. AJ Styles for Dolph Ziggler, just straight up. Doesn't even make sense. On what planet is that a fair trade? I have no fucking idea. Does Monday Night Raw need Dolph Ziggler? No. Absolutely not. Maybe Dolph Ziggler wanted to go to Monday Night Raw. Who the fuck knows? Anywhere Dolph Ziggler goes, I will not be watching with a care at all. That's all I could tell you on that. So what WWE did here is they effective immediately ended the Dolph Ziggler and Otis feud. And they just moved Miz and Morrison from Braun Strowman onto Heavy Machinery. So now we got Miz and Morrison, hey, hey, no, no against Heavy Machinery. Now they're adding Sony Deville as a, I guess, a female lead here in this situation with Miz and Morrison. And then Mandy, obviously, with Heavy Machinery. I'm sure we'll get the one-on-one between Sony and Mandy again. I'm sure we'll get the tag team match between Heavy Machinery, Miz and Morrison. I'm sure we'll get the six-man tag. So WWE just laid the groundwork for about four or five weeks worth of television right there, folks. Very basic, very formulaic, very boring WWE television. Get ready for it. Get ready for it. As far as the promos here, Sonya sounded great. Mandy sounded great. And I'm looking forward to what they produce in the ring together. Every time Sonya is on TV, she's getting better and better and better. And more times I see Sonya nowadays, I'm thinking, maybe WWE should be moving Sonya on from this bullshit and maybe preparing her for a one-on-one match against Bayley for the SmackDown Women's Championship. Why haven't they done that yet? WWE ain't doing the Women's Championship on SmackDown any favors whatsoever. They're making the Women's Tag Team Championships actually more prestigious than the SmackDown Women's Championship. The Women's Tag Team Championships are just enough right now as a catalyst for Sasha and Bayley. Bayley could lose that SmackDown Women's Championship and it wouldn't mean a thing. Because you're making the tag team championships mean something more than the women's championship, the SmackDown Women's Championship. So why not book a match where Sonya actually goes one-on-one with Bayley, beats Bayley for the SmackDown Women's Championship, or it doesn't have to be Sonya. WWE doesn't want to do that yet. They could do anybody in that role and have them be a transitional champion. Then they could have Bayley and Sasha break up when they lose the Women's Tag Team Championships, have that be the true catalyst that they were intended to be to break them away, have Sasha go and be whoever the transitional champion is, and then when that time comes, when it's Sasha and Bayley, then the Women's Championship will be built up a little bit more and be the spotlight, and the championship match would mean something as well. So 
So why wouldn't WWE go that route? It's as if they're doing things backwards. They're holding the SmackDown Women's Championship hostage right now on Bayley because she's beating everybody. But why don't you give Mandy or, or Sonya a championship reign just as a, transi- a transitional thing? Well, it doesn't have to be them, like I said, but somebody. And then make the tag team championship the focus, the catalyst around Sasha and Bayley. Meanwhile, Sasha can come out of that situation and beat the women's champion and get the one up on Bailey. Ha ha ha, I'm the women's champion now. You got nothing. You're Becky, or Becky, you're Bailey no belts. Be- uh, Bailey no belts for Bailey. That's the way that they should do it. Let me know what you guys think about that. But Mandy and Sonya, really, really good stuff here. Looking forward to what they do, but the roles have changed. It's not Heavy Machinery and Dolph Ziggler, now it's Heavy Machinery and Miz and Morrison. New Day, Kofi Kingston and Big E versus the Lucha House Party. Grand Metallic and Lince Dorado, Bailey and Sasha Banks were actually out there at ringside. And I don't know why they were out there. This became apparent as to why they were out there a little bit later on. But this one wasn't bad at all. Tag team match, very good between these two teams. Can't really buy into the Lucha House Party because WWE hasn't given me any reason to care about the Lucha House Party. They're just there. They just exist. They're talented. I just don't care. WWE trying now to act like they have a tag team division. Great. Great. The New Day beat Lince Dorado and Grand Matelik. They'll more than likely beat Cesaro and Shinsuke Nakamura at the pay-per-view. Extreme rules. After that, what happens? What happens? Who do they got left? Who do they got next? Who do they got left in that division? Nobody. And the only reason why Cesaro and Shinsuke Nakamura are there is because Jackson Riker got the Forgotten Sons in a heap of shit. So they had to take them off of television while they were in the middle of a major push. How things work out on SmackDown. So the Lucha House Party, they were in control. Middle of this thing. They scored a near fall on Kofi after a top rope splash by Lince Dorado. Really good. But Big E broke up the pin. Cole said Sasha and Bailey were obnoxious on commentary because they were doing his job better than Michael Cole. Graves was about to drive a pencil through his forehead. Le- legitimately, they showed him. He was very agitated by Bailey and Sasha being there. New Day made a comeback. Babyface comeback here, I guess. Both Babyface teams, but New Day made a comeback. Landed their double team finisher, Midnight Hour, for the win and the New Day win. Shinsuke Nakamura and Cesaro attacked New Day after the match. Sasha and Bailey cheered and said it was entertaining and they loved it. Cesaro gave Big E a neutralizer, which is always impressive. Nakamura then gave Kofi the Cesaro swing slash Kinshasa. I guess Cesaro gave the Cesaro swing and then Shinsuke gave the Kinshasa. So it was a double team Cesaro swing and Kinshasa combo by Cesaro and Shinsuke Nakamura. Cesaro then leaned over the announce desk on the outside, got in the face of Graves and Cole, and said that they are an international heavy-hitting team, the last of a dying breed, and they're sick and tired of being overlooked. Now, all of a sudden, Cesaro is sick and tired of being overlooked. Now he wants his just due on SmackDown. A little bit too late there, bro. I agree with you. I agree with you. You've been overlooked for far too long. You and Nakamura. But I think this is a little bit too late. And again, the only reason why these guys are here and the only reason why WWE is building them up is because A, they have nobody else in the tag team division for the New Day to beat. And B, they are a plan B because the Forgotten Sons right now are legitimately forgotten. And they needed somebody else to fill in for them in their absence. So there you go. Are they going to win the tag team titles? Probably not. Probably not. Why would you take the titles off the New Day when there are zero teams in that division labeled as competition? And Cesaro and Nakamura, listen, I think they're great. They're not even a real team, but they're great. But they have done nothing but lose. They are losers on WWE TV. And WWE is going to do, they're going to have to do a lot more to build these guys up as legitimate tag team contenders. You can't buy into a team like that after a win one week on television and then go to the announce desk and say, shut up, man, we're overlooked and I'm sick and tired of it. Gonna have to do more than that, bro. Seriously, this is your fault. Same thing with Bobby Lashley. Three years wasted 
Cesaro, how many years as this guy just being a mid carder? You're going to have to do more than that. If you want these guys to have a lasting effect and mean something, then maybe you shouldn't book them like shit for so long. That's exactly the feel I get here with Cesaro and Nakamura. Lacey Evans, Tamina, Naomi, Alexa Bliss, and Daniel Brooke were hanging out by catering. Because that's where they all belong. Not Naomi. I like Naomi, but the rest, yes. They discussed wanting to make a statement. Dana then says, whoa, 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 whoa. Everybody is here claiming that they're the number one contender for the women's championship. But Dana said, listen, we're not filler. And we want to prove it. We should all want to prove it. Uh, Honey, honey, you are filler. You are filler television. You mean absolutely nothing when you're on the screen. Just letting you know. Nobody wants to see Dana Brooke wrestle. Alexa wondered where Nikki went because obviously Dana Brooke was not making any sense. Oh, where's Nikki? Have you guys seen Nikki Cross? What? Dana, what are you talking about? Where's Nikki? That's all that did. So Kayla was interviewing Seamus backstage because forget Dana Brooke. She asked for his reaction to the revealing interview with Jeff Hardy and Renee Young earlier. Seamus pretended Hardy called him a bully and he really made him think. And people said, or he said people like Hardy really deserve to be bullied. And his only regret is he didn't crush his voice box too. So he wouldn't have heard this filthy garbage coming out of this junkie's mouth. He said Hardy claimed to be resilient and strong and turned his life around, but he doesn't really believe it. That's where I come in, he said. If Jeff Hardy can't lift himself up, I'll do it for him with a smile on my face. And the only way a proper Irishman can. He said, next week, I'm going to toast to the one and only Jeff Hardy. So please, continue to exploit Jeff Hardy's alcoholism. Seriously. Continue to exploit Jeff Hardy's alcoholism. Great job there, Bruce. You're really a -a one-of-a-kind guy. Honestly. Sasha and Bailey were still at ringside. The match was fucking over. All four of these guys, all six of these guys, I should say, went to the back. They're still sitting out there. Maybe they were going to do commentary for the main event as well. I don't know. So, Sasha and Bailey were at ringside. They were delighted by the news of Sheamus toasting to Jeff Hardy next week. Nikki came up from behind them and attacked them while they were sitting in commentary, tipping over Sasha and throwing Sasha into the announce desk. Soon they double-teamed Nikki, but Bliss ran out, even the odds. She pulled Nikki off of Bailey and Sasha. Sasha and Bailey regrouped as Nikki called them in the ring, sort of yelling, I want some action, let's go, Lexa! I want some action, Lexa! Nikki called out Sasha. Bailey said if she wants a match, I accept. You've got your match. But it's not against Bailey. Bailey accepted for Sasha. And Bailey continues to speak on behalf on Sasha Banks. Issue. Issue, folks. So Cole said Bailey volunteered for Sasha for a match again. This one went seven minutes. This match was joined in progress. Nothing else happened. Back and forth. Meteora by Sasha. She gets the win. That was pretty much it. So I guess this rules out Nikki Cross and Alexa Bliss from getting another tag team title opportunity. Maybe the Iconics do win. I pray to God not. Can you imagine that? The Iconics back in the tag team title hunt and winning the tag team titles. Oh my goodness, man. Can you envision anything more horrifying on Monday night? Seriously. I wouldn't be surprised. This is the Bruce era. Expect the worst, folks. It's coming. We could see the Iconics and Charlotte walk out of Monday Night Raw as champions. Oh my God, this may be the worst Raw in the history. This may be the worst Raw of 2020. Get ready for it. Finally, Firefly Funhouse closed the show. And this was actually very cool. I actually enjoyed this very much. Bray waved to the fans and he spoke briefly in French. He asked if they missed him. No, I didn't. He says he can't wait to tell them what he's been up to. Says he joined the book club. He learned the latest TikTok maneuvers. Learned how to knit and invaded a reptilian stronghold. Was he playing Destiny? I don't know. 
Rambling Rabbit says he's actually been sitting around muttering to himself about losing to Braun Strowman. Thank you for reminding me, Rabbit, Bray Wyatt said. So we've seen clips of the loss. Bray says he realized he went about this all the wrong way. Sound effects played and Braun Strowman interrupted. We see the choo-choo train entrance of Braun Strowman, the Strowman Express. He makes his way down to the ring. He walks down the aisle. He's got his mullet. He's got his championship. He's got his Strowman Express t-shirt ripped off. He's looking good. Strowman. It's in the ring. Braun said Bray had his opportunity and he failed. Braun knows a thing or two about failure, folks. He's the universal champion. And he's a failure of a wrestler. He doesn't know a wrist lock from a Rolex. He said there are no more games. He said the story between them is over. But he's big. He's big, JD. He's a one of a kind athlete. He said the story between them is over. Bray laughed. And he said their chapter may be over. But then he broke into the fiend voice and said their story is just getting started. Then they actually cut to Bray Wyatt and they showed him and they showed him as the old version, version one of Bray Wyatt. He said in order to move forward, they have to take a step back to where it all began. I created you, bro. Therefore, it is my duty, bro, to destroy you, man. I can't find you. You can find me, man. All you have to do, man, is follow the buzzards, man. And then he yelled, run. Blew out the lantern and the show over. So we're not getting the fiend. We're getting the return of Bray Wyatt. Follow the buzzards. JoJo's for us, man. We're getting uh, that version of Bray Wyatt. So, folks, I think a lot of you are probably waiting for me to shit all over this. And I'm not. I'm not going to shit all over it. I think it's actually very entertaining. I think it's actually ingenious. I don't give a shit about the story. I don't give a shit about the backstory of Bray Wyatt and Braun Strowman. Like I said, and I'm going to repeat myself, I think it's the B-side of a fucking imported album from overseas. For example, if your favorite band introduces a new album here in the United States and they have a special edition that was released only in Japan and they got special B-sides that are not available here in the United States, that's exactly what Bray Wyatt and Braun Strowman's Wyatt family run has been. It's like more than B-sides that you may never hear again. It's B-sides that you don't give a shit about. One of them may be an original that's very weak compared to the other songs in the regular album. And then one of the other songs may be a cover. A cover tune. Nobody gives a shit about that. Nobody gives a shit about that. And it's a shitty cover too. Like they'll cover like Bon Jovi or fucking uh, Elton John or something like that. Some fucking weird song and they'll change it into like a death metal, power metal version of it. Right? Dragon Force on their last album covered Cher. They covered Cher. The Titanic theme, Cher. They made it into a fucking power metal death metal song. That's exactly what it reminds me of. Something that I just don't give a shit about. So, even though this is that, and I'm describing it to you as that, I'm glad we're not getting The Fiend. I'm glad we're not getting The Fiend. You see... If the WWE went with The Fiend, then it would be very predictable. And the WWE went with Bray Wyatt, cult leader Bray Wyatt, down on the swamps, Bray Wyatt, lantern Bray Wyatt, right? So it's ingenious that they're doing this because it's not The Fiend and it's very, it's very, uh, I guess, away from the norm. But there's another reason why they're doing this and it's because, folks, if you think the Extreme Rules pay-per-view is the last time we're going to see Braun Strowman and Bray Wyatt, then you're an idiot. You're an idiot. Braun Strowman and Bray Wyatt will continue on to Extreme Rules, and then WWE will continue Braun Strowman and Bray Wyatt into SummerSlam. When has WWE ever shown you that they gave a shit about cult leader Bray Wyatt? None of you really thought that 
this was a little bizarre that they're bringing back cult leader Bray Wyatt? Now, WWE, you got to think about how they operate. They already had Bray Wyatt, Mr. Rogers Bray Wyatt, loose, clean to Braun Strowman. If they gave the Fiend away already, he would undoubtedly have to win the Universal Championship. So what WWE is doing here is they're creating a bridge. Right now, you're walking over the bridge. You're stepping onto the bridge first at Money in the Bank, Bray Wyatt loses. Now you're in the middle of the bridge and it's a little rocky, right? WWE's going to give you cult leader Bray Wyatt. They never gave a fuck about cult leader Bray Wyatt, so he's easily expendable. Bray Wyatt is Bray Wyatt. Bray Wyatt, if he's fucking Mr. Rogers or cult leader, he could lose. The unbeatable force that is Bray Wyatt is the fiend. He's the one that cannot be pinned. Yeah, WWE's already ruined that, but I won't get into that. That's another fucking story in itself that we already went over in February. But the point of the matter is, this is their bridge to SummerSlam. They don't give a fuck about beating cult leader Bray Wyatt. They're going to use cult leader Bray Wyatt to get to the Fiend. Okay, he beat Mr. Rogers Bray Wyatt. Okay, he beat cult leader Bray Wyatt. You ain't going to beat the Fiend Bray Wyatt. That is the end result here. So WWE thinks they're slick. Oh, ho, ho, ho. look what they're doing. They're ingenious. Look at this. How can anyone hate this? But what they're doing is they're prolonging a fucking feud and a match that nobody gives a fuck about, that nobody gives a shit about, nobody wants to see take place in the ring, and they're extending it over four months because they are too stupid to come up with anything else for the Universal Championship. They're too inept to come up with another challenger for this piece of shit fucking worthless champion that you have on SmackDown right now. Class dismissed. I could write this show in my fucking sleep. They're obviously doing this to get you to The Fiend. When have they ever treated cult leader Bray Wyatt like anything? What, two months? Two months. They gave him Ed, They gave him a, a WWE Championship match with John Cena and AJ Styles, and he was looking the best he's ever looked. Then what did they do? Put it right on Randy Orton to put it on Jinder Mahal. Dead. Dead. Bray Wyatt, cult leader Bray Wyatt, is expendable. I don't know what else you want me to say. It's exactly where they're going with this. And I'll tell you where I'm going. I'm getting the fuck out of here, man. Thank you guys so very much for joining me here on the podcast. If you enjoy the podcast, if you enjoy the video, if you enjoyed anything that I said here, enjoyed any of my takes, if it made you laugh, if it made you cry, if it made you angry, if I made you fucking sad, happy, this, that, let me know down in the comments. Hit that thumbs up. Follow me on social media, at JD from NY206. That's on Twitter and Instagram. If you guys want to support the podcast, Patreon is available, patreon.com slash JD from NY206. And if you guys missed off the script earlier today, go and check it out. Major, major rant on WWE's no mask policy and shitting all over their CV19, I guess, protocol and the way that they handled all of this stuff coming out of the Performance Center. Till then, guys, I'll see you right back here on Off the Script tomorrow where we talk about... The Speaking Out Movement, Matt Riddle and NWA and Dave Lagana and Velveteen Dream and all these people that have come under fire as of late. And there is a purge in the wrestling community to weed the trash out. So make sure you guys join me for that. Until then, again, subscribe, hit that thumbs up, and I'll see you right back here on Off The Script Saturday afternoon. See you guys then.